Racist skinheads are among the most dangerous threats facing law enforcement today. The men and women of this violent subculture are sometimes called the frontline warriors of the white supremacist movement. They've committed some of the country's most vicious hate crimes, from arson to assault to murder. We're seeing more and more racist skins operating as criminal enterprises that traffic in guns or drugs. For law enforcement, skins are difficult to track. They've organized into groups called crews. But sometimes they act independently. They tend to move around, often without warning. This can create significant problems for officers attempting to respond to crimes and conspiracies that cross multiple jurisdictions. As skinheads extend their reach, it is vital that officers understand the threat they pose for their own safety and for the public at large. Hello, I'm Joe Roy. As a former homicide detective, I regularly dealt with violent crime. Now I'm the chief investigator for the Intelligence Project. Even though I've spent the past 25 years tracking racist skinheads, I'm sometimes surprised by their brutality. Since bursting onto the American scene in the mid-1980s, racist skins have justly earned their reputation as the shock troops of the white supremacy movement. Over the past two decades, they've committed dozens of murders and countless violent assaults. In 2002, three neo-Nazi skinheads yelled white power as they used their steel-toed boots to stomp to death a 20-year-old Phoenix man as he waited for a bus. In 2003, four racist skinheads used baseball bats and rocks to beat to death a homeless man in Tacoma, Washington. In a letter from jail, one of the skins wrote, I killed him and I liked it. Law enforcement officers have also been targeted. In 1997, a Denver police officer became the first American law enforcement officer killed in the line of duty by a racist skinhead. A week after the murder, a dead pig with the officer's name carved into it was dumped outside a police substation. In 2007, a Department of Corrections officer in Utah was fatally shot while transporting a longtime racist skin from the Salt Lake City Jail to a nearby hospital. Skinheads have been growing in numbers since the 1980s. The first major group was the Confederate Hammerskins, which formed in Dallas in 1987. The group spread throughout the South, then the country, and then overseas. In the late 1990s, a small group split off from the Hammerskins and formed its own crew. They called it the Outlaw Hammerskins. Their creed was to take it to the extreme. If they bring a knife, we bring a gun. The problem is not going away. The number of skinhead groups in the United States has been rising for 10 years. By 2011, there were 133 separate racist skinhead chapters nationwide. One of the groups active today is the Vinlanders Social Club. This group's initial purpose was to challenge Hammerskin authority and take its violence to the limits. Even among the most hardcore Vinlanders, Brian Widener stood out for his willingness to inflict pain at a moment's notice. His weapon of choice was a straight razor. He was in the movement for 16 years before he became one of the very few who successfully got out. He has an intimate knowledge of the skinhead culture. For them, it's an all-out war against society, the very people you serve and protect. As co-founder of the Vinlanders, Brian knows full well the violence his former comrades are capable of. Two members of the Vinlanders crew in Arizona were indicted for the drive-by shooting death of a white woman walking with her black boyfriend on a Phoenix street. In 2007, fellow co-founder Eric the Butcher Fairburn and two other Vinlanders were convicted of viciously beating a black homeless man in downtown Indianapolis. Then, in 2010, Fairburn confessed to the murder of a man in Springfield, Missouri. When the victim's wife found him shot to death at her doorstep, she tried to call police, but found that the phone lines had been cut. Fairburn has been sentenced to life in prison. Brian left the Vinlanders and turned his back on the racist scene in 2006. He has gone to great lengths to break free from his past. Today, he is committed to educating people about the dangers of the skinhead lifestyle and to helping law enforcement understand the threats skinheads pose to the public and to police. He offers the following tips dealing with racist skins.
How is a skinhead group generally organized? There's not much structure in most skin crews, but many do have specific membership requirements that are much like those of an outlaw motorcycle gang. For instance, hammer skins require someone who wants to join their group to be a hangaround for a certain period of time. Then that person becomes a prospect or a probate for up to 18 months. So it could take two years, maybe even a little longer, to actually become a full patched member. And as part of the initiation, some crews require that the prospective member commit violence, sometimes against a minority or another person seen as an enemy of the group. So if a skinhead group is adopting the structure and rules of a motorcycle gang, are there other things that the officers should be looking for? Colors and patches, definitely. Uh, it's like, for instance, the Outlaw Hammerskins, we stole our colors from the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club when we were doing the red and white. That wasn't a coincidence. The Outlaw Hammerskins president's father was a leader of the local Hells Angels chapter. More and more skinheads are getting involved in the Outlaw motorcycle gangs through criminal activity. Crimes such as trafficking and drugs and guns. Others are becoming members. A longtime Confederate Hammerskin in Florida now is reportedly the national president of the Outlaws motorcycle gang. For years he has let his old skinhead crew use the Outlaws clubhouse to hold events that were attended by the Outlaws and other motorcycle gangs. What should officers be most concerned about when they encounter skinheads? In the skinhead way of life, earning acceptance and respect means brutalizing your enemies. When I was a racist skinhead, I was a walking warning sign for law enforcement. I wore my affiliations on my skin and my clothes. The tattoos, the patches, membership in a group, and connections with an outlaw biker gang. Violence was as right and necessary to me as breathing. So how can an officer know when he's encountered racist skinheads? In the early days of the skinhead movement, racist skins were easy to identify. They typically wore bomber jackets and Doc Martin boots, often with red or white laces. The color of the laces was a tip-off back then as to the racist beliefs. White laces stood for white power, and the red laces supposedly meant the person had spilled blood for his or her race. Now skins aren't necessarily wearing the traditional clothing and laces. Officers have to work to uncover their ideology. From an officer's safety standpoint, what is the quickest way possible to learn as much as they can if they've encountered skinheads? Check for tattoos. Skinheads are known for their tattoos. These can quickly help officers determine the wearer's beliefs and membership status. Most importantly, they can also reveal the level of dedication and potential for violence. When I was a skin, my tattoos were advertising my history of violence to anyone who knew what they meant. Tell us about your tattoos. What was the meaning of the arrow? The arrow that I had tattooed on my face was a Norse rune. Runes are symbol in an ancient alphabet. Each one can stand for a letter or have a certain meaning like life or death. The one I had on my face was the warrior's rune. And in the race of skinhead culture, it, it generally signifies the willingness to spill blood for your race. Curtis Algar, he's accused of murdering a Utah Department of Corrections officer. What's the significance of the emblem there on his cheek? That's a Volksknot. It's typically worn by people who believe in a religion called Odinism, which worships the old Norse gods and goddesses. It is a sign that the wearer is willing to die in battle with his or her enemy at any time. If that happens, the person will get to live in honor among the gods. You can tell from the picture that Algeyer has been a skinhead a very long time. The more racist tattoos a skinhead has, the longer he's probably been involved in the movement. Tattoos on the face and neck show a person is so proud of his beliefs that he's wearing them for all to see. Are there other specific symbols they should be looking for? Patches. Skinheads who belong to a certain group usually wear a particular patch to show their allegiance. The various factions of hammer skins all have cross hammers as the main part of their patches, along with certain other symbols that designate their particular faction. For instance, the Confederate flag is a prominent part of the Confederate hammer skins patch. Other groups all have their own distinctive patches. These can help officers identify a skinhead's group affiliation. What can an officer learn from this? This tattoo has a lot of important indicators. One, it's a patch. Tattoos of patches, sometimes called meat patches, show the intensity of a member's dedication. Since a member has to give back his patch if he ever leaves the group or gets kicked out, that patch is tougher to remove if it's a tattoo. Number two, the tattoo is not only reveals the wearer's group, but also his membership status. The crossed hammers show that he's a hammerskin, and he's a full-patched member, because all three components of the hammerskin patch are there. The hammers, the half-cog wheel, and the group's colors, red, white, and black. 
Both the Hammerskins and the Vinlanders had patches, especially for prospects to wear before they earned full member status. Is there anything else the officer should be aware of? Symbols, like numbers and letters, can sometimes help identify specific beliefs. Um, you can often see the numbers 88 used among white supremacists. H is the eighth letter in the alphabet, so double H stands for HH, that means Hail Hitler. 311 stands for Ku Klux Klan, since K is the 11th letter, and the three means three Ks. Skinheads, like a lot of white power people, often use numbers to indicate a group they belong to without spelling it out. If an officer sees numbers on a skinhead, try to match them up to letters of the alphabet. For instance, 38 stands for CH, or Confederate Hammerskins. 28 can stand for Blood and Honor, another skinhead organization. 5-11 is the Prisgian European Kindred. Numbers can also reveal the skin's religious beliefs. 83 means Hail Christ, which indicates belief in the racist Christian identity religion. Letters can also stand for a specific phrase to indicate a group or a particular belief. HFFH means Hammerskins Forever, Forever Hammerskins. So, is it significant if a skinhead belongs to a group? Yes. Membership in a group shows a greater commitment to the lifestyle. Once you join, the other members become your brothers and usually your partners in crime. In fact, most skin insults involve several people, making the attacks more violent. Reformed racist skinheads like Brian are rare. We hope the tips shared will help keep officers safe when dealing with skinheads. If you are an officer who specializes in tracking racist skinheads, there is a national organization dedicated to that purpose. The Skinhead Intelligence Network, or SIN, is a unique network of officers that is meant to aid law enforcement in monitoring, tracking, and prosecuting racist skinheads involved in criminal activity. Active duty officers interested in more information about joining SIN can email their inquiries to skinheadintelligencenetwork at gmail.com.